Hi, welcome to Nashville North Studios. This is Judy, and I'm here uh, today with Molly Carpenter, and we're gonna talk about her art, and uh, we wanted to let you know that we had John Wood and Neil Miranda at her opening. Um, this is the last day of her show, and uh, we're going to put this talk up on our YouTube channel, Nashville North Studios, and you can listen to it once or twice or as many times as you like. But uh, this is a fascinating show, uh, and here's a picture of Molly, and in a minute you're going to see the real Molly in person. So we have her bio, her art statement, and that was her invitation. <clears throat> Here's some of Molly's work. Um, she even wrote a story with this one. So these pieces take a lot of time and patience. I will add this little story called Jonah's Dog by Molly Sanger Carpenter underneath so you can read it. Each uh, piece that Molly does, as I said, is takes a long time. It's done in layers with a lot of patience and uh, nothing's done overnight. Most artists cannot do things that quickly. And this is quite a process which Molly's gonna talk to you about. Now, you can see the glass behind the pieces and uh, the detail that surrounds it. Each one is different. So I talked to Molly a little bit about writing stories and maybe she'll tell us about that because she used to write stories. Didn't you, Molly? Sure did. <laughs> Still do something. <laughs> so this is a great big one. How big is that one? Uh, 34 by 21. 34 by 21. Mm -hmm. The perfect piece for your beachside mansion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then for your Zen garden, where well, here we are with that. Very beautiful. And uh, that piece um, doesn't have paint on it, right? There's no paint? Actually, it also has 10 layers on it, but oh, it's it just a different process. I see. So many of uh, Molly's pieces have sold. Actually, I could have sold a couple of them twice, mm -hmm. but since we don't have them twice, we can't do that. And here's one of the all-time favorites, the Monarch. And of course, we have our Monarch garden out front. So we're very excited about things like that. Look at the fox on the lady's head. And there's the title of it, as you can see. And another favorite is the bunny. So I'm going to turn the phone around now, and we're going to talk to Molly. <coughs> Hi, Molly. Hello. Camera woman Judy, trying to put the camera down. As we all know, it's the phone. So, let's see. Does it have you in there? I can't tell. Wave at me. Hello. Okay. I'm going to tilt it a little more. There, I think that's better. So, hi, Molly. Hi. How are you, Judy? I'm good, thank you. We want to thank you for not only sharing your work at Nashville North Studios, but your view of life and uh, your stories that you have so carefully crafted and painted and layered as life is layered 
um, to reveal another world for us to go into. And I think in your your book or in your in your book coming not out yet. <laughs> not yet. in in your statement you use the words curiouser and curiouser, which is of course a reference to Alice in Wonderland. Yes, as she's falling down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of the way I feel. I'm I'm exploring life, I'm exploring materials, I'm exploring subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the beauty of what I do. What keeps me coming back is every time I make something, it's, it's a new exploration. Mm -hmm. Very good. So uh, we were talking earlier um, about um, where did all of this creativeness start and how did it start and you mentioned that you think uh, probably in the early 1960s mm -hmm. when I was uh, quite young I, I would go over to my grandparents house and my grandfather had a studio on the third floor that overlooked the garden and I would go up there every time I got a chance and kind of see what he was working on. He wasn't really a professional artist, but he did it for the joy of it. Mm -hmm. And he always had a piece in process. And you mentioned that he would actually have a, a little, he would do marsh scenes. Yes. And he'd have a little duck. Yes. Cut out. So the marsh scenes um, would be complete and then the, the ducks would be the last thing that he would add in there and he had these little cut out ducks that were always sort of tucked away in the studio that he would move around on the piece and and find the perfect placement for it. Wonderful. So this kind of sparked you to draw? That was one of the many things, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, um, I grew up near the Delaware Art Museum so I was always kind of hanging out there and looking at the, the artwork with my family. And it was that and just a general love of making the drawings. Mm -hmm. I, I would spend a lot of time as a, a very young child up in my room uh, drawing just for myself, for the joy of drawing, mm -hmm. not, for, not for any accolades or to show anybody, but just for the joy of, of making something. Mm -hmm. And um, that those private moments then uh, took you to regular school. Mm -hmm. And when you were in regular school, um, did you have art classes? Yeah, my, my school had some really good art teachers and a beautiful um, studio that w the kids could use. It was designed by a man named Holmesy, uh, who was pretty well known in Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to spend a lot of time there at school and out of school. I, I got to take some lessons at the Delaware Art Museum. Um, I, I, I also, when I got a little older, when I was a senior in high school, I was able to spend um, my entire senior project working for an artist in Delaware. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you discovered that you didn't really want to take some studies. And so you went to a different college, if you will. Yeah, I went to Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, my, lots of people were trying to steer me into a, a regular program where I could get a degree and I could teach. Mm -hmm. And I just, I do not have that gift. Um, I consider teaching to be a, a great gift mm -hmm. and I don't have it. And I knew that wasn't for me. I, I knew that academics were not something that I was particularly good at. And so I, I found a program at Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, it was a certificate program. And I, I went there after graduating from high school. Mm -hmm. And how many years were you there? I was at Pennsylvania Academy for a very short time. Um, it was uh, summer into, it was almost a year. 
Okay. Um, but then I, I found the Frudekas Academy of Fine Arts, which was next door to the Peel House in Philadelphia on mm -hmm. Chestnut Street. Mm -hmm. And Angelo Frudekas had taught at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and had left to open his own place. So I, I went there because I knew that by that time, I knew that sculpture was the direction that I wanted to go into. And that's what he did. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that he did. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me a little bit about how large his pieces were. Oh, these were actually Angela Frudekas's pieces were good size, mm -hmm. and he has several pieces in Philadelphia. Um, but after I, I went to school there, I went back to work for Charles Parks. And oh, okay. His pieces were 60 feet tall. There's, okay. there's one at the Delaware Memorial Bridge. Oh. When you drive over, it's at the, the um, one of the Catholic churches. Mm -hmm. And she's a, I think she's 60 feet. She might be a little less. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she's stainless steel and it's all welded and it glistens in the light and she stands and it's, it's a magnificent thing. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So um, when you were there um, with Frudekas, mm -hmm. um, what is it that um, he did that gave you the um, courage to make sure that your work was what you wanted it to be? He was very not demanding, but precise in his mm -hmm. teaching methods. Mm -hmm. um, and every part of the human body in his method and re in reality is connected in what he called arithmos, which is Greek for rhythm. Okay. Um, and they, the, as, on top of the arithmos, there, there were measurements that needed to be taken for every piece of every part of the sculpture that he made. And if things weren't done just right, he would come along with his spatula and he would just say, okay, uh, you need to start over and he'd take it apart right in front of you. Wow. Yeah. That had to be difficult at first. It was. Yes. I mean, as an artist, you have an, you have an ego. Mm -hmm. And I, I know very few artists that don't. Um, and it's hard on the ego. Yeah. But, but eventually you come to understand that it's for the best. And those lessons, you don't forget them that way. Either. No. They stay and, with you. Yeah, so when you work on a piece today, all of that history is behind what you're doing. Uh, you know that it has to be, the measurements have to be in scale, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, and to tell your story that you're trying to reveal. Yes. So things aren't askew. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I, my work now is perhaps slightly more expressionistic. Um, there's, uh, not quite as much precision to the measurement and all, but I, I feel that it, it's still there. The bones are still there. Mm -hmm. So um, you said you went to work for Charles Parks in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And what did you do there? Um, well, I worked his enlarging and reduction machines, uh, mostly doing reductions. Um, he was well known for, for monuments around the Delaware area in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these huge pieces that he would make, he wanted to have a smaller version so that he could sell those to the general public. So the machine was pretty interesting. It, it was a pointing machine and the one and would point to the larger piece while the other end would point to the piece that you were doing small and spend the day just scraping the clay oh. and scraping down the large one and you get the same shape as on the small one so i did that and i also learned how to make molds and i learned how to cast fiberglass 
I learned how to do patinas. Uh, I learned the bronze process, so he didn't do his own casting there. He had foundries for that. Mm -hmm. um, it, was a, it was a very good learning process there. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And how long were you working for him? I, I worked for him off and on for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then I got married at a very young age and I, I bought a house and opened a studio. And well, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Where was that? Uh, that was an hour away. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I knew when I was working for Parks that what I wanted to do was to be like him and and make monuments and uh, have a great big studio and um, of course life doesn't always work out that way. Yeah. I I have done several public art pieces, mm -hmm. but I I've, I've found that I really, really enjoyed the process of doing my own kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, although I, I will do public art pieces, and okay. I enjoy it, uh -huh. the, the pieces that I make myself. And what about the rose? You were telling me about the rose. Oh, the compass rose. When yes. I was 27, I got a commission um, from the Delaware Heritage Commission mm -hmm. for a project called the Constitutional Compass Rose. Um, that had been a brainchild of a man named Walt Phillips. I knew it was in there. I was <laughs> trying to think. <laughs> um, he had come to them with this idea, and so they found me, and I worked with lots of committees and uh, the people of Delaware, and, and finally made this 12-foot bronze that still sits in front of Legislative Hall in Dover. Okay. So in the notes underneath of this, we'll put uh, the actual title as you described it and where they might find find it to see a photo of it and, sure. and read about it. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. And you also have a website too. I do. Uh, is, are things like that on your website, your history and they so are. forth? They are. It's mm -hmm. a website that I've spent a long time building mm -hmm. and I... I dread the day when I have to rebuild it because yeah. <laughs> all those pictures that are up there have been years and years in the making. Yeah. It's complicated. It is. Yeah. 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 I understand. Yeah. And <laughs> I have a I have a program that I use now that is no longer supported. So I have a computer that's just dedicated to that. Mm -hmm. um, one day I'll have to do something about it. Yeah. Well. That day always comes for all of us, doesn't yes, it? Yes. So um, you uh, you did those things, and then I guess the next question would be: What inspires you? What is it that you will see that will trigger you to uh, create, or the idea is born in your head from some inspiration along the way? And where are those places? Well, we talked a little bit about icons and I iconoclasts. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to Italy, I went in every church that I could uh, just to, to soak in the visual imagery. So the, the cathedrals, um, having grown up in the High Episcopal Church, I, I was so taken by the imagery in, in those churches too. Uh, very much, but then there's also the, the carnivals, mm -hmm. um, the joy that people have when they go there, and the if you if you've ever looked closely at a a merry-go-round, a lot of the carvings you couldn't you could kind of compare those to cathedral carvings in a way. Um, so cathedrals and carnivals and nature. And um, just, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> oh, so, a nudge. so in uh, iconic, uh, iconic mm -hmm. art, it's usually a human being. Yes, it's usually a saint. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm what I'm 
I'm doing is bringing forward the everyday as as being sacred also mm -hmm. not not the mundane but to me that which is sacred that I see when I'm out every day in the forest in the field yeah. um, and elevating it sort of in stature mm -hmm. Do well, we get excited when we see a butterfly? Yes. Or a frog in swampy bottom? Absolutely. Absolutely. And these are the things that propel us uh, to be drawn into nature and to wonder what their story is. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're telling to me. That's, that's what I feel when I look at your work. And each one's an individual, and you yes. see those frogs. They, yes. they're all, they all have their own story, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So um, where do you think you'd like to go with your art? I've given up on making plans. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that the process in itself is a destination. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important to me to spend the time in the studio mm -hmm. and just to be in the moment. And that I, I think where I, I'm going is wherever it takes me. Yes. And I don't know where that'll be. Well, we don't know, and it's revealed. It's like a magical mystery tour, almost. Uh, it, all of a sudden, we see something, and we go, ah, aha, that's where we're going. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So I love that. Usually when I'm out walking. Mm -hmm. And you have a wonderful place to walk, don't you? I do, yes. Yeah. We, we live in an old farmhouse, and... Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the fields all have trails around them. And mm -hmm. I have two Porter Collies that need a lot of exercise. Yeah. So I'm out all the time. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So you get to see it in changing seasons. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is important too. My neighbor once asked me, how do you do this every day? The same thing, back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, it changes all the time. Yeah. And every day I see something new. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and with climate change, mm -hmm. um, I the other day I was in the garden and I saw something that I didn't recognize. And I looked it up on the internet. It was actually a species uh, from uh, South America of a almost a cross between a butterfly and a hummingbird, but it was definitely a hummingbird, but it was one like I had never seen before. So we don't know what we're going to see. And when we do see things, sometimes we don't know what they are. Right. So. Right. Quite often. Yeah. <laughs> Thank heavens for Google. <laughs> <laughs> so part of today, you are going to show us mm -hmm. a little bit of your process. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, can... Do you have to get up and move around the room? I don't need to. I, okay. can, I can pretty much point from here. But okay. um, so what I do, um, each, each piece is started in clay. I work in an oil-based modeling clay. Mm -hmm. um, I can't stand the feel of water clay on my hands. It's, it's just one of my things. And this is the clay that I, I used in art school. So. Um, I have vats of it from some of the bigger projects that I've done. And because it's oil-based, I can recycle it from piece to piece and tear each piece apart when I'm finished. So how that happens is I make the, the piece in clay first, mm -hmm. and then from the finished clay, I make a mold. I brought a mold here as a example this is um the mold for this piece oh, right up. here kitty up yep so um when the clay is finished i want to i don't want to turn this over because it's going to make dirt on your floor um when the clay is finished i paint layers of rubber onto the clay okay um this process takes basically about two weeks. Wow. Yeah. And then the the rubber after it's on the clay. I'll do that. So 
pretend the clay is under there like that. Mm -hmm. It sits for 30 days and cures. And after 30 days is up, then I make this part, which is called the mother mold because it snugs it like a hug, like a mother would give her child. Mm -hmm. And after that, I peel the, the rubber from the clay, recycle the clay. And then what the original clay was is now in reverse in mm -hmm. the rubber. And then from that, once it's cleaned up, because that takes some time and it's a real mess, I cast into it the final product. And for that, I use HydroCal. Mm -hmm. And I do it in layers and I reinforce each layer with uh, fiber. So that what you get is a hollow reproduction of the clay. Okay. And that's how it comes out of the mold. Mm -hmm. um, it needs usually a lot of cleaning up. Mm -hmm. So I, I clean it up. It's called chasing when you clean up a sculpture. I clean up the sides. I clean up any holes. I fill the holes. I use my rasps and my sandpaper and I, I get it just perfect before I can put the finish on it. Mm -hmm. I forgot to say. <laughs> this also has to sit for 30 days. Okay. So that sits for 30 days and this sits and for 30 days. And it was two days. weeks before that. Yeah. And then so now we're at two months and two weeks. And I'm asked why I don't do this on YouTube, but uh, you or, or have people in my studio. Yeah. It would be very boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so after this sits for 30 days, um, it's ready for the finish. Mm-hmm. Um, and the finish is first, first it's sealed and I, I make my own shellac out of, um, Everclear and shellac flakes, moonshine. <laughs> but I found that the, um, the bullseye shellac that I use mm -hmm. sometimes when I have, when I don't have any Everclear, <laughs> um, it, it gives me a headache because there are other things in it, mm -hmm. um, dryers or, or something. And the, the Everclear and the shellac mix is just very pure and doesn't give me a headache when I use it. So I seal it and then it's ready for the finish, mm -hmm. which is um, 10 steps. I, I build it up uh, layer by layer uh, with the final layer being an emulsion that I make from the 24 karat gold powder and I think, a binder, <laughs> a binder. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I do the painting inside. Um, I generally don't know what it is I'm going to paint, but it sort of speaks to me. It'll be revealed. It, absolutely, sort of like Michelangelo. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, take my time with the paintings because I really enjoy that process and do the, the gold leaf when that's finished, that is usually in the form of the moon behind the painting. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, I, I take my time and I choose the perfect glass, which involves like bringing a lot of glass out of this big chest of drawers that I have next to my studio and just holding up pieces. And mm -hmm. it, takes a, it takes me a day usually to figure out what I want to use. That's special glass, though. It's it not is. just any glass. Oh, no. The dichroic that I've been using recently is really nice. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just a joy to work with because it's such a pure color. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to... Um, that comes in sheets. And, of course, you score that and cut that. And then after you've got it scored and cut, then you can nip it down into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. um, which takes time, but it's, I, I find it's worth the, the end result. Mm -hmm. um, I do the mosaic and then the last step is to do the grout. And once the grout cures after a day or so, you clean it all up and um, seal the grout after a couple of days. 
to make sure it's it's dry. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be dry, dry, dry all yeah. the time, or yeah. else you get peeling. And then uh, I last thing I do is I, I put the the felt on the back mm -hmm. and um, wire it. I, I forgot to mention I put the the hanging mechanism. I build it into the okay. piece when I'm building it. So while uh, it's still wet, can you do that? Um, actually, it's within the layers. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's in there with fibers, so it's mm -hmm. not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then I have a finished piece. There you go. <laughs> May we get this one down off the wall, and you could hold it with the mold, so people can see the finish. Sure. There you go. I'm determined to make a mess of your mm -hmm. There we go. Mm -hmm. So that's from start to finish almost. And what, for this particular piece, if you guessed at the length of time it took, what would you, what would your guess be? Oh, man. Well, the clay itself, in a perfect world, I'll have a couple of weeks to work on that. Mm -hmm. Um the drying time, I don't know if you want to count that, but... No, um, I think we have to count everything. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the drying time is 60 days, and so a couple of weeks, and then uh, probably another, yeah, probably about three months. <laughs> At least three months. Yeah. For just one small piece. But I do, I juggle a lot of different mm -hmm. pieces all at the same time because mm -hmm. of the the drying time that's involved right and um, that way something's always coming forth mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but I couldn't call you tomorrow and say I want a kitty out for myself and that would take you time to that do it that would take some time yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah very nice do you ever repeat your designs for like if I if I wanted one of those that's already sold mm -hmm. is that something you would recreate then in number or would you not I wouldn't do it exactly. Okay. It would be a different version along the same mm -hmm. theme. Yeah. So each one that you create is an original. They're all unique. Yeah, they're all yeah. unique. Like their creator. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Very, very true. Very true. Um, you're greatly admired, and we're so happy you could be here. I'm so glad to be here, too. Thank you. And I just want to mention that we are going to have another opening next week. Uh, with Kim Wyland, who is a wonderful painter, mm -hmm. uh, and he will be here in the solo room. Uh, Luminous Scapes is the name of the show. So the group show and that will be opening on Friday, the fourth Friday, which there are five in July, uh -huh. so Friday the 22nd. So if anybody wants to come visit us, with live music and nice people and reservations and timed entry are a must. So we thank you again, Molly, and we look forward to having your work available for people and there will be a few pieces left here mm -hmm. uh, that we can show people uh, if they're interested. Uh, we also ship, we're shipping pieces to California uh, hand delivering to Pennsylvania, and uh, they're going lots of uh, exciting to exciting homes. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye for now. See you next time.